Hello. Hi, Andrew. Hello. All righty. I see you're trying the video. Hopefully my internet connection is better. Hopefully the problem's not on your end. Uh, if you do cut out, we'll just do a quick restart and we'll shut off our video. No problem. I'm using speakers at the moment. Um, if there's uh, feedback, then uh, I'm happy to put headphones on. But uh, it looks like it seems all right to me. I don't, I don't notice any feedback or anything of that nature. I'm using a fairly decent professional microphone and that's fairly directional, so that seems to be doing the trick. Anytime you're ready, Andrew. Okay, um, so um, I guess due to the, the lag, I missed the end of, of Ken's recorded piece there, which I was just watching when you called me, but that's all right, I'll catch that afterwards. Um, you probably can't see exactly what I'm wearing here, but this is actually a uh, badge or pin or what do you want to call it um, from 20 years ago, which is actually, actually, I'll hold it up to the camera. This is a, a Xanadu logo pin that uh, happened to be in my drawers immediately behind me. Um, I thought I'd wear that because it's apposite. Um, now, I'd like to say, um, first of all, that uh, uh, I'm delighted to have been invited to participate in this event and, uh, and to, uh, with so many other wonderful people who Ted has always attracted and, and uh, been involved with. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting and even working with some of the speakers today, uh, largely through Ted. Um, and. Uh, You'll have to forgive me if I ramble a little because I'm very sleep deprived. Um, I had, uh, I think, four hours sleep uh, the previous night and um, uh, a little nap of less than an hour uh, la this last night because I was watching the whole, uh, your, your wonderful event um, during what would normally be my sleeping time. Um, but uh, those of you who know me well will say that you probably won't be able to tell the difference because uh, I'm an inveterate rambler as it is. So I hope you'll forgive me nonetheless. So um, uh, I plan to uh, use my time uh, to the extent that I can, subject to the, the time available and the, the vagaries of the internet connection, first to um, perhaps give a little bit of my background and what brought uh, me together with Ted, um, a bit of uh, reminiscing about some of the things I've done with Ted, um, some responses to some of the other speakers. Um, I have a page covered in notes now. Um, and. Um, uh, if there's time, a little bit about um, the things that particularly inspire and motivate me, which, which are connected with Ted's work. Um, to go briefly onto a meta level, um, when thinking about what to talk about, I was thinking that essentially what we do at this kind of event is that we, uh, one of the things we do is we communicate by referring to other people's work, um, but also by placing that in context, uh, why you should be interested in uh, the other work that we're referring to these days, of course, with the you know with Google and what have you, it's not necessary to give a full citation, but merely to to reference something to sufficiently that you can find it for yourself. But you need that context as to why would you even be interested in in looking at that other work. So um, in the part where I I respond to some of the other speakers who've gone before me, um, I will um, uh, talk about things that uh, that that inspires in my mind and that, that I hope you might not already know about and might find interesting. So that's my prefatory remarks. Um, giving a little bit of my background, um, I uh, have always been interested in uh, both technology and culture and media. Um, the reasons for this um, uh, is partly, I think, my, my background, my upbringing. My father um, was um, uh, born in England but is from a European Jewish background. Um, his parents had to flee during World War II, um, and my grandfather was, was murdered by the Nazis. Um, there's a plaque now in Vienna to him. Um, and so my father was uh, very, um, uh, and, and is, a very educated and cultural gentleman. Uh, we always had a lot of books in the house, and I, as a young uh, boy, I read a lot of, um, you know, the complete Sherlock Holmes, the, you know, and uh, we, the complete Lewis Carroll. We had all this, these sorts of things lying around the house. Um, so that was certainly inspirational to me. Um, before I'd even heard of Ted. And in fact, um, uh, so reading was encouraged and I was an inveterate reader, um, quite a rapid reader. Um, and in fact, um, in my school days, read the entire school library, starting with the things that most interested me, like fantasy and science fiction, and then working my way through to ultimately I'd read all the romance novels and everything else as well because, um, you know, I ran out of things to read. Um, so during this process of reading my way through the school library, eventually the, the school librarian just stopped 
having me check things out. She just said, just take stuff and bring it back. Um, sometimes I go through 10 books a day. Um, and uh, in the process of reading through the school library, I was very fortunate the school library happened to have a copy of um, Computer Lived Dream Machines. And that was my first exposure to TED. I think that uh, uh, that may have been the Microsoft Press edition, I'm not sure. Um, but at any rate, um, this was around 1984, so uh, 30 years ago now, uh, pretty much the same amount of time that um, I gather that uh, uh, Dame Wendy Hall and uh, Jaron Lanier have also uh, known of TED's work for roughly that same period of time, roughly since 1984. Um, and uh, I immediately wrote off to the Xanadu project, uh, which at that point was, I believe, um, sponsored by Autodesk, and uh, said, look, I'm fascinated by this. Um, I was uh, still in school, in, in high school, I was 16 at that time, um, and, um, and said, look, I, I need to know more about what you're doing. And, and, uh, and uh, there was a thing in the, in the book that, that said that um, you could be involved in the project. So um, uh, sure enough, Ted responded, and, um, and he sent me um, some material and, um, and I got an early Xandal and what have you. Um, and uh, I got periodic communications from the Xanadu project um, for the next few years. Um, but it wasn't until a little bit later than that um, that um, after I'd met uh, my lovely wife, Catherine Phelps, who you may or may not hear from, we're doing this from my house, so it's possible we'll get her popping in later. Um, uh, she uh, is a writer and in fact has um, uh, her first um, degrees were um, in the US um, uh, and then ultimately she also got a doctorate in creative writing for digital media um, and so she was also fascinated by TED. Um, so uh, the two of us um, went to the US, Catherine Velters are in the US, she's from there, and uh, during our trip we decided to meet up with TED and Marlene and met them on the, on the houseboat and hit it off and uh, consequently we went on to have a, um, a quite a long working relationship since then. First, with uh, with Catherine and I organising a speaking tour for TED in Australia, and subsequently I became uh, TED sysadmin and have, have run his um, his Anadu, um, uh, domain and servers and stuff for I think 20 years now since '94. Um, so that was how I came to it, and uh, uh, I've also um, had the pleasure of assisting in various other ways. I did early prototype of Zigzag um, and. Uh, we did some early experimentation with wearable computers, very early wearable computers, which were these amazing belt-mounted Pentium 3 things that emanated heat into your body. And uh, so um, all kinds of, of interesting things that, uh, that I've had the privilege of, of enjoying with TED, including um, Bruce Dimension, TED Nelson Month. I was delighted to be invited to come participate in that as well. So um, uh, let's see, uh, what else can I, can I say about... Um, uh, well, I'll actually I'll, I'll go back a little bit to a little more on my background. Um, I mentioned that I've always had an interest in both technology and culture. And um, as I say on my own website, um, the technology side of it comes from, I think, my one of my early recollections is that when I was very young and my mother was carrying me around in her arms, I would actually reach out to light switches and, and flip the lights on and off. And I was particularly fascinated by um, exclusive all light switches which um, you would have a room with the need for switches at two different doors and so they would actually be wired up in such a way that uh, both switches would control the light so you could turn it on or off from either door and uh, this in fact was a, an exclusive all mechanism just by the na nature of the way they were wired and I was fascinated by that from you know the age of I don't know probably about three or four or something and I then went on to uh, explore in, in, in sequence um, you know, electricity, electronics, um, uh, digital electronics, early computers. Um, uh, you know, we had um, ancient computers at, at my school. We had a PDP-8 and then an LSI-11 and, and uh, you know, Apple II and up through the history of computers. Um, and I was interested in each level of that, you know, how, how the physics of transistors worked and, and how, um, how um, uh, digital circuits were put together and how CPUs operated. And I um, designed um, a, um, a simple... Um, um, a CPU when I was young and I designed a simple operating system and then I made my brother sit underneath a desk and, and fed him instructions and had him, had him execute them. Um, and so um, this whole um, desire to be a generalist and, and understand everything was very much part of my life all along and, and Ted absolutely tapped into that because I think he also is a great generalist um, and I was immediately attracted to that when, when I, I had the pleasure of actually meeting him and, and indeed even from his writings. But in parallel with that, I have also always been very much interested in um, culture, both 
um, national cultures but also popular culture and I'm an avid collector and my wife and I collect all kinds of media. We have um, behind me is part of my video game collection um, in other rooms in this house. I've always needed to have a house big enough to accommodate a library and so in other rooms in my house we have my comic book collection, my book collection, my video collection, um, every form of media. Um, and uh, professionally I've, I've uh, been involved as a computer programmer, as a system administrator, um, you know, again, a bit of a generalist, uh, and have had an interest uh, in computer-mediated communications. As, uh, as uh, was discussed earlier, computers are now central to the way we communicate, and that has always been an interest of mine. Um, uh, I was involved for a long time with computer bulletin boards. I ran first one bulletin board and then a network of, of three-state network of computer bulletin boards, um, then got involved in the internet, um, was involved in implementing um, connections between uh, the early internet and um, uh, um, teletext technologies very early in my career. Um, and um, and uh, uh, at the moment I actually work for a media company. Um, uh, so um, all of those things uh, you know, are very deeply intertwingled um, and, uh, in my life and, uh, and uh, as it is in, in, in a sense in the world. So that's, that's uh, kind of what brings me to, to, to uh, involvement with, with Ted and his ideas. Uh, and that led me to, over the years, as I've um, had other day jobs, I've spent a lot of my spare time in, uh, you know, uh, either following along um, relatively passively or actively participating in, in, in Ted's work, uh, to my great pleasure. Um, I've uh, had the joy of working with Ted in Japan for a while, thanks to, to Kay Nishi, who I haven't heard speak yet. I, I hope he'll do that later today. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I hope to continue collaborating with Ted for, for some time to come. Uh, there's, there's still plenty more to do. Um, there's uh, zigzags progressing quite nicely since, since that early uh, demo that I worked together many years ago. Um, and, uh, and I hope we'll still be able to, to show a lot more with that. Ted's, Ted's I know, are going to, to uh, talk a lot more about that later on. Um, but um, I would now like to transition to responding to some of the things other people have said earlier today. Um, there's, there's plenty to talk about. Um, uh, uh, of course, I've already alluded to the fact that, uh, that all of the speakers in today's event are uh, in a deeply intertwingled, uh, largely thanks to Ted. Um, uh, and um, I was delighted to see uh, you know, the, the little video from Freud's students because um, it's certainly true that, uh, that Ted's work has a, continuously appealed to new generations constantly, that, uh, that every new generation has, has found something to like about Ted's work and has, has, has connected with it, partly because so much of, of Ted's ideas have not yet been fully realised and, and there's, you know, there's still an opportunity to, uh, to do more and to, to achieve more. It's, it's often said that uh, you don't really want to try and, and, uh, and do Shakespeare scholarship because there's so much Shakespeare scholarship already that you're reduced to finding the tiniest little niche to do a doctorate. Whereas uh, with Ted's work, there is so much yet to do because Ted has, in a sense, taken on such a grand challenge that, uh, that there's so much opportunity for people to, to leap in and, um, and, and join in the project and, and, and do things. And this has, of course, been a, a negative for Ted personally as well because very often people who have been inspired by Ted have gone off in their own direction and have, you know, have seen how it inspires them, how it connects with something that they want to do, and then they've headed off in that direction. And while it's quite possibly been a benefit for the world at large, it often hasn't been of benefit for Ted achieving his own goals. But um, I, I think, you know, while progress has been slow, I think it's very clear that there has been forward progress. And uh, I hope there will continue to be uh, ever more forward progress and we'll see more and more of Ted's ideas realised. So that's, that's I'm always optimistic and I think we've, we have achieved and will continue to achieve in that area, even though early progress was certainly quite slow and disappointing. I think recently we've we've started to really lift our game, so that's that's great. Um, okay, uh, I uh, responded to Wendy's um, uh, response to the question about uh, the governments wanting to take control of the, inter of the internet and of, of world communication, computer-mediated communication. That's certainly, you know, an age-old battle and, and something that we have to deal with. And, um, uh, you know, there are people like um, John Perry Barlow and more recently Cory Doctorow who have been very active in, in uh, looking at how 
that's going to pan out possibly how we, we will have potentially dark nets and mesh nets and things like that where uh, there will be more disintermediated and more distributed uh, ways of communicating. Um, the internet is already an attempt to do that but we may have to once again step one step further back and uh, away from centres of control yet again because the, the pendulum has swung back towards, as, as uh, Jaron Lanier pointed out, um, to a world where there's a, a tendency to get the Googles and the and the Amazons and, and the Facebooks, all of whom operate massive data centres because of economies of scale. And, and um, again, we may have to look at how we can atomise that again. Um, I um, also wanted to respond to David Rosenberg's fascinating um, history um, discussion that uh, he mentioned that in the 18th century it was uh, believed that a well-rounded polymath had, had read essentially um, a, a significant proportion of all available books. And um, uh, that really resonated with me because I mentioned that I was I read the, pretty much the whole school library and I was a, was and still am a great fan of fantasy and science fiction. And uh, indeed, early on, I believe I had read a significant proportion, very nearly um, uh, you know all that was available to me of pre-1980 science fiction, which is you know a fairly bounded set. After Star Wars, of course, science fiction took off and became far more popular and more widely published. And now, in the days of the internet and in the days of uh, you know, of, of far greater accessibility of things that are not uh, published in the in the more traditional big media sense, um, it, it's an impossible task. Obviously, there's there's no way I could read even a fraction of, of what's published um, in even in genre fiction. You know, it's it's just not possible. But certainly, all of the greats um, uh, in the early days I, I had access to, and so I myself have gone through this transition between being able to um, read and comprehend all of the the canon to suddenly going to this firehose world that we live in today. And, of course, I'm hardly the first person to, to realise that we need tools to deal with that, and, and, um, and Ted has, has certainly been one of the, the great contributors to that, that issue of how do we deal with that. Um, uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, the discussion about books as an operating system, another prominent um, uh, uh, mention of that concept is just before the novelist, the British novelist, has... Um, some uh, some books, enjoyable books, called the Thursday Next series of novels, um, in which he quite explicitly um, has this idea of, of a book operating system, uh, not only as a device within the novels themselves, that the, the characters, many of the characters are aware that they're characters, um, and there is, um, the characters move between different levels of reality and into fictional worlds and out of them, but indeed he applies that to his own print books, that he treats them as um, you know, as, as artifacts that can be edited and upgraded, and he asks his readers on his website to apply patches. You know, and and, and you can actually write in the, the frontispiece of the book what version of the book you currently have once you've applied the correct patches that that fix any errors in the book. Um, so I find that quite entertaining and, and relevant. Um, I also want to mention um, that uh, in the discussion about um, uh, uh, Marx and technology and, and where we're going there. Um, that uh, I was exposed at school. Um, it was required reading to a local Australian Ooh. luminary, um, Barry Jones, who was um, the science minister in Australia and uh, was also a long-time president of our Labor Party, the um, certainly by US standards rather left-wing political party. Um, uh, and so he probably would have been aware of Marx himself. He published um, a very influential, in Australia at least, book by the name of Sleepers Wake, the uh, Technology and the Future of Work. And he originally published that in 1982, uh, amended in later years all the way up to 95, fourth edition. Um, and the thesis of that book was indeed this idea that, that uh, you know, that the rise of technology and influence of technology in our society was going to um, uh, impact um, employment and, and, uh, and the, the tasks that people did. So, um, you know, this is an idea that I was exposed to even quite early on. So we see this recurring theme that many of these ideas are, are not um, necessarily um, unique to one person in one place, and uh, um, there's that old saying that the future is not evenly distributed, that, that ideas arise and they resonate with people more in one place than another, and they gradually build momentum and, and become more widespread and more accepted. Um, so uh, it's been a delight to see how that's, of course, happened with Ted's ideas, that, uh, that more and more his ideas, which initially seemed um, not only... Um, revolutionary and controversial, but in some cases, um, even in the early days, I think potentially heretical. Um, uh, they are certainly, I wouldn't call Ted's ideas mainstream now, but they are certainly um, 
either better understood or um, equivalents have arisen. And uh, I think that's, that's all to the good. Um, the negative side, of course, is that sometimes once equivalents have arisen, you're kind of stuck with um, a, a, an alternative in the same uh, ecological niche, which is then hard to displace. So that's, that's a problem in its own right. But um, uh, looking at the flip side of that coin, a 90% solution is still far better than no solution. So sometimes even when a, a competitive idea has, has invaded the ecological niche, at least it still contributes to overall forward progress. Um, also, uh, let's see, um, Douglas Hofstadter was mentioned. Um, uh, he's well worth reading. Um, uh, he, in fact, refers to the, um, uh, the John Searle's Chinese room um, uh, thought experiment where, where you get people to translate mechanically, and that was an argument, and the, the famous AI argument that uh, Minsky and Hofstadter have, have, have weighed in on as well. Um, but in addition to referring to that in his book, I believe it was in Mind's Eye that he referred to that, um, he's also written a marvellous book um, called uh, uh, Le Tombeau de Moreau uh, in Praise of the Music of Language, which is entirely about translation um, and uh, is, is fascinating as well. I, I, I really enjoy that. I actually mentioned that book partly because I traded a copy of um, uh, Ted's most recent book. Um, Ted, uh, Ted sent me another copy of Possiplex in the, in the speaker pack, um, but of course because I'm uh, privileged to be Ted's Australian agent for that book, um, I will just sell it and pay the money back to Ted. Uh, but Because uh, I have my own copy that Ted's kindly signed for me. Um, but I traded one copy of that book for the Douglas Hofstadter book. Um, and uh, so that was, that was quite amusing. Um, of course, Ted got paid for that copy. Um, but uh, I should also mention that uh, I haven't mentioned yet that um, uh, I have been involved with the open source community for a very long time. Um, I actually am a committee member of the Linux Users of Victoria, um, and I also have been for 10 years a, an elected um, board member of Electronic Frontiers Australia, the equivalent of Electronic Frontier Foundation in the US. It's not uh, affiliated directly, it's just an equivalent. Um, so those are all passions of mine as well, and, uh, and in some ways parallels and connections with some of the other speakers. Um, Let's see, um, how are we going for time? Still got some time, good. Uh, what else have I got here? Oh yes, um, uh, there was a reference earlier on to um, simulations, uh, Ted's thoughts on simulations. I just wanted to quickly mention a story which some of you may already have heard, um, but um, there was, uh, maybe not, because this may be an Australian story, but there was uh, an attempt to use simulations as a, a teaching aid in schools, which of course they're well suited for, and the, um, the students, it was groups of students at the schools who were all um, doing some kind of simulation of, of uh, how to run the planet or some, the country or something like that. And uh, you got the, the classic thing that often happens is you got uh, unexpectedly realistic emergent behaviour because there was a 10 year time span in the game and the students who won realised that they could uh, apply a bit of, uh, of, of meta thinking and they could actually completely break all the rules and spend all their budget and, uh, and, and, and totally not worry about consequences in the final year of the simulation run because there would never be an 11th year. Uh, it's exactly analogous to what politicians often do when they know they can't be re-elected due to term limits. That the students had figured out that, that because the simulation was going to end uh, after the 10th year, they could pretend the world did not exist in the 11th year and they could just completely um, loot the treasury and, and, and do all kinds of things uh, taking advantage of this discontinuity. So I thought that was kind of an amusing story. Um, that, that, you know, the assumptions encoded in the simulation do often reveal quite a lot in and of themselves. Uh, let's see. Okay, um, I think that's most of the notes I had here. Um, oh yes, I also wanted to respond to Noah's comments about um, games with shooting as a primary mechanic. Um, I mentioned I have a big collection of games behind me. I've, I've long been um, interested in computer games um, uh, as, you know, as, as a medium and, um, and because they're fun uh, and a good way to learn too. 
And uh, it is, of course, very well known and quite notable that so many computer games are about shooting. There's even, you know, people mock, uh, game critics mock um, first-person shooters and call them brown shooters because they're so often brown in palette, you know, um, or, or man shooters because you're going around shooting men all the time, or manly men shooting other manly men. And um, one of the reasons, I think, for this, uh, some game critics have said that it's partly because uh, when you're looking at ways to interact with the virtual world, Destruction is one of the first and most obvious ways to have an effect on the world. Uh, it's kind of a two-year-old's, you know, <laughs> way of dealing with the world. Is, is, is poke at things and see if they break. Um, and so, the game industry is only just barely moving on from that that simple idea that that a simple game mechanic is. Let's see what we can smash. Uh, you know, for a long time it went beyond just the um, who can we shoot, and it actually went up to the can we add more destructibility to the environment was was a big checkbox for, for game designers, you know. Um, so uh, thankfully we're now starting to move beyond that and look at other things that, that games can do and, and, uh, and uh, that's, I think, a much needed improvement. Um, so that brings me to, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, my own passions um, which are um, uh, uh, hinging off what I said about um, about being interested in, in, in culture and popular culture as well as national culture. Um, I'm also very interested in what is often called fan fiction, but in fact there is really a continuity between fiction and fan fiction. It, it's really not a separate thing. Um, it never has been because even published authors sometimes play in other authors' worlds and sometimes even get that published. There are, there are obviously in modern era there's, there's copyright issues around that, but it has been known to happen. Um, there are some particular stories around that. Um, uh, Neil Gaiman, for example, has has written H.P. Lovecraft spoofs and had them published. Um, and uh, a pint of uh, Shoggoth Soul Peculiar, I think, is, is a story of that kind. And um, um, uh, oh, no, I've blipped his name. Um, it'll come back to me. But um, a noted science fiction author who was recently president of the Science Fiction Writers of America, um, uh, I can't believe I've forgotten his name, but um, he has in fact um, uh, written and published um, a, uh, a reworking of an H. Beam Piper story which he wasn't intending to publish but his agent contacted the estate and said, uh, you know, would you grant permission for this? And so occasionally this, is, this has always happened uh, that, that, that fan fictions become, uh, you know, ascended fan fictions and become, become accepted in, by the, uh, the, the community. But um, the divide was, was always grey anyway. We have now, I think Amazon's trialling a, a system where authors can grant permission in advance, pre-grant permission for other people to write within their worlds. Um, and um, in um, Japan, the fan culture is very, very um, widespread and, and often crosses over into, uh, you know, Gainax famously, um, the, um, uh, the animation studio, very famously started out as a bunch of fans doing fan animations and, and then became a, you know, a mainstream animation studio. Um, and uh, the same with Dojinshi, the, the, the Japanese um, tradition of, of uh, fan published zines. Um, again, that there's a big crossover between that and, and actual comic books and actual animations. Um, so it's it's really it's all just one big intertwingled world of publication in which um, there's always there's always a conversation between the fans and the, the between the readers and the writers because in fact to some extent we are all both consumers and creators of culture and this is this has always been the case. The internet has only um, enabled this in a way that was that was more difficult earlier. It, it's, it, you know, it's not a new thing. And, uh, and, uh, and so um, Ted's ideas about how we can structure the, the technical mechanisms, I think, are, are still very much needed to, um, to assist and to amplify what's achievable there because it uh, provides important, uh, more powerful connections, more powerful context, and those things, I think, are all um, very valuable and important. Um, uh, I've recently become, I've uh, mentioned this, um, I know Belinda Barnett is, is on the program for later and um, uh, she and I and Ted were doing an event in Melbourne a couple of years ago and um, one of the other speakers there, I started talking to him about uh, this topic, about fan fiction and I mentioned that I've recently become interested in the, um, the recent remake of the venerable children's show My Little Pony. Um, because um, it is a preeminent example of this kind of, of um, culture as a group activity. Um, it's 
hardly the first fandom to do this kind of thing. Harry Potter fandom, for example, has spawned a thing called Wizard Rock, where where um, uh, fans make Harry Potter-inspired music. Um, but um, the My Little Pony fandom, which has attracted in the in the recent remake, not so much in the original 1980s version, but in the recent remake, um, has in, attracted uh, adults and males as well as females. And um, as a consequence, there is an entire culture around it of people creating their own their own work, which includes people in the you know in the U.S. military um, participating in creating music and um, and artworks and and uh, there's a also a surprisingly positive relationship between the, the rights holders and the fans, which, which I think should only be encouraged. Again, not the first to do this. Star Trek has been reasonably good about this. Uh, sorry, Star Wars. Not so much Star Trek. Star Wars has been reasonably good about this. Lucas has been reasonably good about supporting um, fan activity. And, uh, and uh, so it's not unprecedented. But, but Hasbro, the, the uh, owners to the rights of, of My Little Pony, have been surprisingly interactive with the fans. And... Uh, uh, of course, it's surprising because of the way our copyright laws work that there's always the danger that someone will be accused, you know, tr traditionally people who, who create work and are paid a lot of money for doing so, um, once they're being paid a lot of money, there's the risk someone will sue them for a, a, a portion of that, uh, claiming that their ideas have been stolen. And so the tradition is that, it, uh, you know, you try not to read other people's writings if you're a writer, you try not to listen to other people's music if you're a musician, um, that are directly involved with the property that you hold the rights to. But uh, Hasbro have been reasonably good about this and have, uh, you know, have interacted with the fans in, in quite surprising ways. For example, there's um, uh, a European animator who has made a music video based on characters from the show, um, which is equal in quality to the, the, the show itself. Um, and um, uh, after some initial um, consternation and confusion and cease and desist flying around, Hasbro have licensed him to continue to do that. Um, uh, the, you know, to avoid losing the trademark, one solution is rather than just banning people, you just license them to use it. And, uh, and likewise, there's a company called um, We Love Fine that produces t-shirts and they actually sell a wide range of t-shirts not only with the corporate um, content on it, but also with fan content, which therefore requires both copyright permission from the fan creator of the work, but also corporate permission for the trade, underlying trademarks. And, uh, you know, this kind of, of cooperation only grows the overall audience and, um, and contributes to the overall development of the culture. And one of the reasons I think why this is an interesting meta text, an interesting work um, in its new incarnation and why it appeals to adults as well as to children is because like Bugs Bunny, it is heavy with references and connections to other works. The modern My Little Pony consciously references, constantly references earlier works. Uh, even early on in the series, there's a scene that is a direct shot-for-shot -shot remake of a scene from Star Wars on purpose. Um, you know, there's, there's constantly, there's um, a more recent episode where there's um, a character who is intended as a reference to Doctor Who. Um, you know, and, and, and so um, this kind of interacting with other works and, and uh, speaking to other works and referencing them um, is, in a sense, it's kind of postmodern, but it's, it's also... Um, made very visible something that's always existed, that culture is, is really one big giant intertwingled thing. It's not separable. It it's never has been. Uh, all of culture is interconnected and more modern works actually just show that more visibly. So that's, that's my real passion is looking at, at these kinds of trends towards more interconnectedness, um, more ability for people to, um, to communicate and to, um, to speak to each other and, and um, learn from each other's cultures because I think a lot of the most interesting stuff happens at borders. At, you know, the most interesting art is often at boundaries and borders. Um, and so um, the way that over time we've had more and more communication, more and more connection, um, you know, with the advent of more travel, and more, more communi uh, communications, electronic communications, commu computer-mediated communications, has really assisted that, um, uh, that uh, I think, ultimately very positive um, uh, interfaces and connections between people and ideas. And, uh, and um, Ted is a, a significant contributor to the thinking around how can we manage all of this complexity. Um, so that's, that's my reason why I think he has been relevant to multiple generations and will continue to be relevant. Um, and, uh, and I'm delighted to have been um, privileged to be part of that 
for all these years, for, as I said, going on 30 years now. Um, and um, I heard some muttering. Does that mean that I'm coming towards some time now? Yeah, if you wanted to go ahead and take a question or two, if there were, while Dick Heiser gets set up. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, I think that that'd be great. Um, um, questions, please. Uh, can I mention also that um, uh, please do use the, the microphones. Uh, when I was watching the stream earlier, some of the questioners um, uh, could not be heard on the live stream because they apparently weren't using the right microphone. If that happens, could I also ask the speakers to perhaps summarise the questions for the benefit of people who couldn't hear the question? That's some good advice. Thank you very much, Andrew. It doesn't look like there are any questions at this time, but uh, if anyone has any, Andrew's easily findable on the web, and I'm sure you can send him an email. Thank you very much, Andrew.